Welcome to today's session, talking about volatility, regulations, you know, cybersecurity is going to be covered, Reg BI is going to be covered today. So for those of you in the audience that's an independent broker dealer or an RIA, this is going to be relevant in terms of how to take what you have for document storage, how you would take your purging, your all bridge, all the different systems, planning software, and connect that to create a very, call it, autonomous Reg BI tracking solution. So I have three great guest speakers with me. I have Daniel Kenny, he's the CEO of Feature Vault, Scott Patterson, uh, Vice Chairman and Co-Founder of Feature Vault as well, and Tom Burmeister from Conquest Planning, a visionary planning platform with a tremendously amount of embedded APIs and uh, AIs that we're going to be talking about. AI is also something we're going to be touching upon as we think about how to take all the different topics you're about to hear at the conference over the next 48 hours. I think this is a really good way to start that off. Now, by way of introduction, Daniel Kenny is a 22-year-old veteran executive, uh, former COO of HSBC, with a very large enterprise global perspective, and he's joined the entire uh, Future Vault platform because the Future Vault platform is very two-sided. It's B2B to C, enables a broker dealer and OSJ to essentially track the entire flow and audit trail of a rep and an advisor within your practice. So, Daniel, would you talk about a little bit about why you joined Future Vault? and kind of how you've seen your global experience play into the Vault platform that you guys have. Thanks, Franklin. Thanks for the introduction. Nice to see everyone today. Um, what attracted me to Future Vault was, with my banking experience, seeing the importance of documentation, data, compliance, and operations in a bank, and making sure that you can integrate, collect documents, structure them, extract data, both structured and unstructured, and then use that for intelligence, uh, operations, KYC, that type of use case, and this platform has it. So I was introduced to the platform to the company, saw it, loved it, invested, and uh, now for the last year and a half, I've been the CEO. Thank you, Dan. And Tom, you know, I know that you've really, you know, you've had a very strong and extensive history from advice and building that up over eight years, and then with Conquest Planning, you know, leading that charge in the U.S., building that planning, with embedded AIs and APIs. Talk to me a little bit about, just brief background, you know, about Conquest and what you see with, with that platform. Sure, uh, good morning everybody. Thanks for, for joining us bright and early. I think, you know, certainly was, was attracted to Conquest by the, you know, the, the depth of, of expertise of, of the leadership and the founding group. Um, the fact that we were able to start with, uh, with a, a true modern platform built entirely upon, uh, upon APIs. So even our, our own user interface consumes our API and really kind of enable that next generation of planning, which we think is, is going to be focused more on, on scaling advice to a much broader audience than, um, than firms are, are currently serving. I think all of us can, can, can agree with that. Uh, and enable firms to also consolidate their technology footprint a bit so that from a compliance regulatory standpoint, a lot of themes that, that Franklin talked about, so that we, we have one calculation engine that's powering advice across the entire well, spe well spectrum being delivered through different empathetic experiences, uh, and then also enabling advisors to become more of behavioral financial coaches and then embracing that side of, of advice as, as well. So we're very excited about uh, about making the entry to the U.S. Um, after you know, some success in, in both Canada and the U.K., so it's great to be here. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Tom. And save the best uh, right here is uh, Scott Patterson. Scott, uh, I've had the pleasure of meeting and getting to know. He is a powerhouse. He is a legend in Canadian capital markets. He was also, most people you know, should really see him as a global executive because he has Series 7, 24, built one of the largest investment technology banks in Canada, uh, as well as the vice chairman of the Toronto Stock Exchange. From my perspective, Scott built and you know has this visionary of Future Vault because actually built from your personal experiences. You know, where do I keep all the documents and how do I engage with my financial advisors, my brokerage? But not only that, you know, it's important to know that Scott, when I met him, he to explain to me about this vision of a two-sided vault. It captured my attention because, first of all, the people need that, and second of all, the advisors need something else 
to engage with the client, to control all the document handling around that entire client relationship lifecycle. So Scott, just for a few minutes here, you know, what in your words inspired you to really create this uh, platform? Well, thank you. Good morning. In a few minutes, I thought I had the next 15 minutes. I'm just kidding. Um, what we are doing at Future Vault uh, is we are really pioneering the advent of a new category that no one in this room has heard of. But I'll predict five years from now, it'll be literally common vernacular. And we believe that every single person on the planet, and certainly every client, of a broker dealer or an RA will have what we call a digital personal life management vault. Now, on one hand, you might say, well, what's their, you know, what is their uh, website access to your business or what are they using Dropbox for in their personal life? This is a whole new paradigm shift. It really matters a lot to firms and it really matters a lot to advisors. But we live in a world now as a consequence of digitization in which we have increasingly point solution after point solution. You're your bank uh, point solution, your brokerage firm point solution, on and on and on and on. You'd be shocked when you think about Netflix. It's a small point solution, but it's a point solution. And I believe and we believe that this aggregation is coming, and so we built this incredibly secure vault with a, a tremendous amount of functionality. At the end of the day, it's, you know, we, Daniel and I are an interesting team because he lives and breathes compliance and regulation, and that's a massive benefit of our solution. And I live and breathe that client experience so that they day in day out think about their relationship with your firm and say it extends beyond the managing some of my money extends beyond financial planning and estate planning and just to give you the sort of the, the punchline I went over the other day 10,000 documents in my vault I was shocked by that but I don't save I don't think I save junk I certainly save all my financial related documents but I also save my eyeglass prescription my kids bronze medallion certificate so if you sort of get the picture of where that's headed, what happens is that value proposition relationship between the broker dealer and the RIA and their end customer, that's what I live and breathe, that end customer experience is gonna change and the paradigm with respect to how they interact will change. Thank you, Scott. The reason why we've also had these three great gentlemen together is Scott is the great example for a ultra high net wealth family dealing with the financial advisor from the customer perspective and also obviously having that enterprise background. Conquest planning, future planning is really open. A lot of other platforms, whether it's Money Guide or eMoney, it's very legacy oriented. So when we saw Conquest planning where they're API centric, it enables large companies, IBDs, RIs to really scale and start capturing a lot of, call it elements that can come up, whether it's new regulations from the SEC or FINRA or both, and then uh, Daniel with the global enterprise context of building that platform up. Now on my side at AppCrown, we integrate Pershing, Allbridge, a host of all the vendors down here from Black Diamond all the way to Adapar into Salesforce. So if you have Salesforce, we can connect all of those systems together. Here's a brief background. So we are a multi-custodian. Uh, we've been in the business working with Pershing, now Pershing X as well connecting all those systems together. So if you want to track your reps, you want to track their OBAs, all of that can be done within Salesforce as you know, but getting that content of your financial account data, your, call it, um, ACCT files, account files, money line, all of that connected into the system so you can view that, that's what we do. But I want to talk a little bit about the regulatory framework that's changed for this year specifically that's coming down to affect a lot of our customers. One of our largest customers with Pershing today is Davenport, which meant about 40 billion, 300 reps. Some things that we're doing with them today that involves these uh, two companies is connecting the Pershing data into Salesforce. We're tracking net new money across all the reps. So that way you can say, other than the NAV moving, you're going to be pulling in all the purging data, you're rep, bringing the rep codes, you're integrating commission data systems together so you can track <coughs> net new money. And how do I not only track net new money, how do I make sure that my firm is protected from negative churn? If I have commission-based systems, if I have variable annuities or out of surrender, I want to put them into more fee-based products, how do I keep track of that? And that's kind of where the new regulatory framework 
and the relevancy of this content kind of comes together. So a new regulatory framework basically says that electronic data keeping is kind of the move forward. Warm storage takes a cost about one to two million a year, depending on the broker dealer. With this entire platform together on Feature Vault, you're looking at halving those costs tremendously. But not only that, you're archiving it so that way there's searchability in those documents, which we're going to talk about with the audit trail embedded in the Feature Vault platform. And then you want to basically also take all the annuities out of surrender and find all those commission based relationships and create a financial plan and track those plans tied to that rep code. That's how you're going to basically scale the entire hybrid practice and govern the entire, you know, how are you engaging with the client? Was this a fiduciary based conversation or, or was this a suitability based conversation? So we're going to start with planning software 2.0. <coughs> now, the future of planning incorporates digitally open and API and also AI centric uh, type of topics. These topics, best reserved for Tom here, is something that I really want to touch upon. And I know there's going to be a lot of AI talks. Way too much, more so than I ever thought possible. Like, okay, this just seems so out there. But in many ways, it's very real too. So, Tom, talk a little bit about conquest planning. You know, when you work with the advisors in capturing data points on what the advisors are doing, how many plans are they doing, how is conquest differentiated from you know, we all know the money back pros of the world, so, so and, and, and their legacy. So how is that being evolved from your perspective? Sure, so I think really the, uh, the, the origin of Conquest kind of started with, with the fact that we hadn't seen planning evolve really past that trial and error approach that, that most tools out there are, are taking. And, and so advice on the, on the Conquest platform is, is really starts and ends with, with our strategic, uh, or I'm sorry, our intelligent assistant called Sam, which stands for, stands for Strategic Advice uh, Manager. And, and Sam has a lot, a lot of things that, uh, that it assists with throughout the Conquest planning experience, but I think what Sam does best is, is actually ranks and prioritizes strategies uh, in less than a second, hundreds and hundreds of different strategies uh, in a way that's not only contextual to the, to the client based on the preferences that they've shared with us, uh, around things like what can they afford, like you like you would expect, but also of course objective factors, uh, what, like you know somebody's willingness to, to make certain changes in their financial life that uh, that may have you know either a positive or, or negative impact on, on their financial plan overall. So that's really where it starts and ends with us. And I think uh, the other thing when it comes to regulatory compliance concerns is, is when, when we talk about API first approach, a lot of times that gets more associated with okay we can serve that up in multiple different experiences. Absolutely true, but I think. What's also most important is, is how much the API first approach enables your, your firms from an operational standpoint. And when you're looking to partner with, with vendors, how much, of, uh, how much can that vendor accommodate uh, certain operational changes that you have, whether just through preference, changes within your organization, or things that are, that are that start and end with, with regulatory compliance things that need to, uh, that need to happen, and, and how much baggage comes, comes along with that in terms of how much it's gonna cost you, uh, and from a resourcing standpoint, how long it's going to take your teams, and also from the vendor standpoint, how much is that di you know, distracting them from, from different R&D initiatives uh, that they have as well. So I think it's, it's really both sides of the coin when it comes to you know, APIs as well as, as the AI that's running uh, on the front end and powering some of that business intelligence on the back end as well. Yeah, and, and we see that a lot. And we're, we're also seeing is that the traditional planning software companies out there are not as API centric as, you, as your platform is. And a lot of the, whether you're a large family office advisor, whether you're a large uh, independent broker dealer like that before, they're looking to save plant history. They're trying to save all of that data so that way when volatility hits, you can bring that to not only certainly the client and the regulators, but more so the client. Here's what happened, here's how your plan has evolved with us, here's how your net worth wealth has grown with us. You know, here's how we're protecting you and how we're trying to stay on plan. So plan history and having that API is sent into all the different systems at a very scalable model, that's what is, is highly attractive. So let's shift a little bit about saving that plan into the Vault Master mindset. This is the last vault you'll need. That's how good Future Vault is from my perspective. So I'll, I'll, I'll actually ask this question to Scott as you think about how you dealt with work with advisors yourself. You know, when volatility hits, whether it's a prime brokerage, a private investment, looking at the statements, or I believe there was that one case where you were looking to get a new prime brokerage account and you had to fill out all these different documents. It's the same document you fill out for the other prime brokerage account. It's ridiculous. So from your perspective, you know, how 
is it beneficial really to share that with an advisor, have them see, log in, see the audit trail, see whether or not they've actually logged in and done their work. You know, talk to me about that experience. There's both the advisor side of the story. I started my career as a financial advisor. I loved it. I loved to cold call then. I still love to cold call now. And I, I feel like I know what advisors do day to day. And then I uh, built a, a technology investment bank in Canada when we came to the United States. As, as Franklin said, I became Series 7 and Series 24. I'm lucky enough to have a, a number of brokerage accounts to this day. So I, I get to see, actually, you know, their onboarding, uh, their communication tools, uh, all the, the workflow and things of that nature. And a very simple example, I made an investment in a hedge fund about a year ago in New York City. And interestingly, they closed the investment. And then about two months later, their fund administrator, uh, they sent an email via their fund, the fund administrator sent the email via the hedge fund saying, we need all this compliance information in connection with anti money laundering and all the appropriate stuff associated with KYC. And for those of you that know on the client side, you experience it on the advisor side by knowing how frustrating the client is. I mean, there's nothing more painful than putting together nine or 10 documents, including your utility bill to prove that you live at the house that you say you live at. And the, the thing about what happens in our technology is uh, the, they could have, uh, had that hedge fund been doing business with us, sent us a checklist from their platform on a white legal basis, but instead, uh, which is a secondary way to deal with it. I put together all those documents. Now, in fairness, my controller put together the documents. But once she did, she created a special folder called Compliance, and now that folder lives there in perpetuity. And since then, we've pointed to it on multiple occasions in connection with other investments. So, yes, you want to obviously have your arms around your client. You want them to have as much of their uh, share of wallet uh, you know, with your firm. But the reality is most people are going to deal with multiple firms. And if you can add value to them in that simple example of allowing them to have that information in your vault with your brand, which you don't have any access to, by the way, other than the information that you share with them, but they can permission in. One of the patents we have is our permissioning technology. They can permission in a banker because they're trying to get a mortgage to see statements. They can permission in a life insurance agent. They can permission an accountant, et cetera, et cetera. In this case, what was fascinating was, and this is where the world's going, the fund administrator on behalf of the hedge fund was permissioned in our vault. Now, you've probably never heard of us, anybody in this room. They've never heard of us, but they took it at face value, and someday, hopefully, a lot of people have heard of us, and then it will be really taken at face value as a standard. But it was quite interesting, so you can see on our audit trail, uh, it was Fermidium, Fermidium out of uh, New York, a fund right. administrator that went into that part of my vault, and we saw what time they looked at it and downloaded it. That's the future of how things are going to change using the digital vault construct. Thank you. And last question for, for Dan here, you know, as you look at, uh, I call it embedded, embedded digital regulations, you know, from your perspective, when you're managing HSBC, can you talk to me a little bit about some of the regulatory, really heightened regulatory things that you had done, and also how this is going to protect the company from, you know, all the different things that could come across from regulations that could be just in time too, or it just drops out tomorrow as, hey, this is the new things that both advisors and broker dealers need to do. Like, how does this this vault keep you nimble? Yeah, definitely. So the way we used to look at it was you had regulation. So regulation's dynamic, it changes. And so if there's a new reg that comes out, there's a new, then a policy in the company. So you have this waterfall of regulation, policy in the company, and then procedures, and then they're actually doing it. So that ability to real-time demonstrate that I can scale my business, in multiple jurisdictions with different regulatory requirements, I can implement policies and procedures and demonstrate real time that we're following those procedures. Often there's a gap between policies and procedures and what's actually happening on the ground. And so how do you prove you're doing what you're doing? It's all about the documentation or not a trail of your operations. So being able to provide a regulator, an auditor, come into the platform, you can see everything that's going on and we reconcile it back to policy, procedure and regulation. So being able to do that real time, being able to help companies scale and be comfortable scaling that you're not going to become too big to manage, you're not going to have you know, gaps in your policies and procedures that you get in trouble. So that digitization of operation, compliance, you know, making sure you can reconcile that against regulation and policy is critical. It could be fatal. So we consider, that's where I see the platform, that's where I see the world going. A financial plan, you want to memorialize it. Put it in a vault, you got a date stamp, you got a baseline, you can refer back to it, etc. etc. So that's critical to a firm and enables them to grow comfortably. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. So what you're seeing here on, on the screen is 
all of that coming together with Salesforce as kind of a chassis. Now, most people think Salesforce is a CRM. I've never worked, looked at Salesforce like a CRM. I've been a partner with Salesforce since 2008, 2009. Salesforce, for me, is a database. It's a data warehouse. So for all of you in the room thinking about, I need to create a data warehouse project. I need to budget one to two million dollars to build that data warehouse. Think of Salesforce. Salesforce is that data warehouse. Because most people don't think Salesforce is built on Oracle. That's all it is. It is a database that when you populate that data with your Pershing accounts, your Allbridge, whatever it may be that you're aggregating, DSC, DTCC, that can get you what you need from a low-cost data warehouse. And what you're seeing here is an actual visual example, a sample of what we've done for Davenport. 40 billion, they're managing reps across the nation. We are integrating with Pershing's uh, rep files. We're integrating with the commission systems, and we're essentially replicating that entire rep system inside of Salesforce, the visualization of it. And then we're connecting with the planning, we're connecting and archiving all of the documents so that way from a separate uh, digital regulatory perspective, you can go into Future Vault, grab the documentation, you can go and see how your reps are performing. So from a company looking at all the reps and advisors you're doing, you can do that from a single source of truth, and which is really just Pershing integrations and the entire Pershing data system, where Salesforce is not necessarily a single source of truth, but Salesforce is certainly that repository of that single source of truth. So I'll end there. I really appreciate everyone taking the time this morning to listen in, listen to these fine gentlemen. They're so handsome, look at that. Uh, meet and greet afterwards. It's and, true. Uh, yeah, especially that guy there. So really appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Brendan. Thanks so much.